ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another thing where I talk about things. Today, an episode where I am gradually becoming more desperate for a haircut. I will get one soon. My hair gets very bushy over time. It gets curly. I can't really control it anymore. It's not so bad today. I washed it. I mean, I wash it regularly, but I washed it. I washed it not long ago and combed it so it would not be so curly. Anyway, though, today I would like to talk about a rather contentious subject. I have actually brought up some stuff sort of regarding this before. But uh, gender ambiguity, this is sort of an interesting thing. It's gotten rather popular lately in the media, especially on Tumblr, where you see more, more people kind of expressing their opinions in blogs. And uh, it's something that I think about fairly often, because mainly I think because I have a friend who's really, really into the subject of gender studies. I mean, he majored in it, I think. Is he, I think he majored in something else, too. He went to college, and not, not an unintelligent guy, kind of a fairly smart guy, and I think that's what really bites him, is that he trusts in his own intelligence, and he feels like he went to college to learn about this stuff. And this is gonna... Uh, I'm gonna rattle cages with this episode of Personal Time, because what I'm not really gonna do, I'm not gonna take a stance on anything, but I'm just gonna talk about kind of where we are with the research in this subject, and some of the major hurdles that we're facing as we kind of go forward looking at this subject. Because there are a couple camps, and uh, I'll say right now that there is no camp that is correct. They're all kind of in the dark. They're all shooting in the dark. Because before we even get into anything, I've got to sit down and we've got to talk about what it means to make a model. And I've talked about this before in some of my other videos, but in every discipline we have what we refer to as models. Like for example, gravity is a model that describes how bodies interact with each other. You know, you drop an apple, it falls to the ground, that's gravity. And we have a simple equation that describes how gravity is supposed to work. It's a fantastic model, it works really well in a lot of situations until you get into molecules, in which case the model doesn't work. Now, this is, this is a really important thing to think about. When I talk about models, you might have something that works. It'll fit, it'll fit a certain subject, like gravity fits large objects, objects that we can pick up and move around. But it doesn't fit molecular objects, and so what a lot of physics is doing right now is they're trying to figure out how to make a model that includes the molecules in with the large objects. They're trying to figure out why the, the large object model doesn't work for small objects. And this is kind of where we're at. Well, in psychology, we make models as well. And the problem with psychology, though, is that we really don't have the technology yet to look into your brain and see how things work. Like, for example, we know that serotonin is an important neurotransmitter. Serotonin may, in fact, contribute to your mental health. It may make you depressed if you don't have enough serotonin. Uh, a lot of drugs today, we call them tricyclic drugs, or SSRIs, they're serotonin, selective serotonin, Reuptake inhibitors. Sorry, I'm just interrupting with the post edit here. Tricyclic drugs are not the same class as SSRIs. They're totally different drugs. Ignore what I just said. What I talk about after this are just SSRIs. What they do is they they prevent your body from reabsorbing, reabsorbing serotonin. And that way, if you take the drug for like a month, then your body kind of builds up a stockpile of serotonin and supposedly this would make you a little bit happier. Now. We treat people with SSRIs based on the assumption that their, their depression is caused by low serotonin levels. Well, the, gra the, the, grim news, gra the grim news is that unfortunately these treatments, they only work for about a third of people starting off. Like you'll start taking the drug, it'll take about a month to kick in, and if it's working, it works. You know, the doctor will follow up, with, he'll follow up and they'll say, how do you feel? And you say, I feel better. And it may not be the case, though, that this is your concern. There's also a lot of different reasons why you might have low serotonin. It could be caused by stress. It could be caused by genetic reasons. There are some people who are born with uh, these carriers that move the serotonin around. You've actually got little things. They're, they're like little... Uh, they're just little chemical guys. They've got, like, legs. Some people have shorter legs on their little chemical carriers. So as they walk up and down your brain, they don't move as quickly. And so that's a problem. There's a lot of different reasons why you might have low serotonin levels, but they find, like I say, only about a third of people who get this initial treatment, it works out for them. 
And then other people, they need to follow up with other kinds of treatment or they need to try some other things or you, they might find that, you know, like they still feel sluggish or they still feel this, or they still feel that. So the doctor will try some other meds and they'll kind of get them going. In fact, uh, just yesterday, this was kind of interesting. I had a person call the pharmacy that I work at and they were looking for a drug. It was a, it was a, a monto anti, mono antioxidase inhibitor. And this is something like I thought that they had stopped prescribing those because these drugs had so many side effects. It's stuff like you can't eat sliced bread if you take this kind of drug because it interacts poorly with the MAOI. And, uh, but it just goes to show that there are still, there's still not really very good models for psychology today. So when I get into stuff like the concept of gender and how we develop our identity as a gender, you have to understand that when we get down to things that we're currently treating, like actual depression, where we look into your, we look into your neurotransmitters somewhat, maybe after you, after you died, and we say like, oh yeah, he didn't have a whole lot of serotonin. We don't even have models that are 30, we probably have models that are less than 30% accurate today for describing how your gender develops. And I can cite reasons for why I believe this is true. Uh, the reason why I think this is true is because we don't even really understand why people are gay currently. Like when we get into, uh, like, like so, so you have this friend named Frank and Frank just likes dudes. Well, if Frank dies and we cut open his brain, if we look at his brain, there's really not a whole lot different about Frank's brain compared to anyone else. And we don't really know what part of the brain specifically causes you to have urges to, to sleep with other people. Specifically, we maybe have a few theories, but we haven't pinpointed it out yet. Uh, there has been some research that shows that a certain part of the hypothalamus might be a little bit smaller in gay men compared to like heterosexual men, but that's unconfirmed. Part of the problem with that is that when you're looking at dead bodies, you've also got to figure out like why did they die, and so you have problems with statistical significance, where if you don't have enough people in your sample that are consistent, you don't have good statistical significance, and on top of that, statistics only take you so far. They just help you develop a good hypothesis. They don't give you empirical data, strictly speaking. They just give you some, some uh, like an area to springboard off of into better research. So where we are at with the subject of gender studies is we have people gathering statistical data, and it's very, very, very political. You have, you have people who are just like putting together very small studies and then asking very leading questions and then sending everyone home and saying, there, you know, I proved that my data is accurate. And you get into this kind of thing. But gender ambiguity is actually a real concern. We know that it's real because people are sometimes born and they have uh, ambiguous gender traits. Like for example, their genitalia may not be fully formed and we can see that they, they're just, they're ambiguous. We don't really know for sure, just at a glance, whether or not they should develop to be male or female after birth. So what the doctors then have to do is they have to, what they currently do now, is they'll try and test your hormones and they'll figure out which side of the hormonal uh, area you stand on, whether you're more testosterone or more estrogen. And based on that, they'll do reconstructive surgery and give you hormone treatments as you get older. And they'll kind of try and lean you towards towards what your body seems to be designed more towards. Um, this is also a subject of debate because now I'll get into the different camps. There's the biological camp of gender development and then there's the more cognitive camp of biological development. And I say cognitive because there's a couple different branches of psychology. As I, as I talk about, psychology is not very accurate right now. It's still kind of a developing science. We don't know how the brain functions too well. So you've got different ways of looking at how to study people. There was like behavioralism was, a, was an approach that people used to have. And that was that if you just observe people, then you can sort of divine their intentions through observation. And of course, there's a joke about behavioralists. It goes like this. Uh, one behavioralist sleeps with another, and then after they're done having sex, one turns to the other and says, that was good for you. Was it good for me? Haha, ha, it's a joke because they were able to observe each other getting it on so they could tell what, and you kind of could unless one of them was lying. And this is the problem that you get into with psychology is that when you research people, you rely a lot on self-reporting. Like you, you ask them questions, you give them a treatment, and then you ask them questions and if they tell you like, well, I felt happy after the treatment, then you can mark that down as a, as a success. But the problem is, if your study is not established well, like for example, if you don't have a good control group, then your whole study becomes aborted. So for example, there was once a study, like if you do a study 
and you give one group a treatment and you do nothing to another group, then the group that got a treatment will feel better, but not because your treatment is working, it's because they think they'll feel better and it's all about self-reporting and so when they tell you that they feel better, they just think that they should have felt better. Meanwhile, the group that got no treatment feels like they got no treatment, they tell you that they don't feel better. Uh, but then if you give that, to get a good control group then, you need to give one group a saline injection, have one group uh, that gets the drug that you want them to take, and then one group that does nothing, maybe, if you really want a group that does nothing. Although you'll find that the group that does nothing will mostly just be feeling hopeless. So, yes, that is what we get into, and more often than not, you will be shocked how frequently, how frequently in psychology we get studies where we have no control groups. At all! And they rely entirely on just self-reporting. Like, you'll get people who... <clears throat> I had my friend link me to this study, and uh, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself once, but I was arguing with him about this whole subject. And he was telling me that getting a surgery, gender reassignment surgery, where you have uh, plastic surgery that superficially changes your appearance from male to female, was uh, was a good idea because it, it makes you he goes he goes uh, studies show that people who get this surgery are like 90 percent happier like 90 percent of the time they're happier than when they started and uh, and i actually got mad at him because first of all like i just explained to you guys depression meds only treat people about 30 percent of the time so when you start telling me things like if you tell someone like oh yeah yeah this this problem for this psychological this psychological problem if you treat this with this particular thing you know you've got a 90 percent accuracy rate that's unheard of in psychology today we do not treat people with such accuracy it just doesn't happen so he linked me to this study and what it was it was a small study it had like 20 people in it and it was all just self-reporting like they they like it's like you go, went through this all this because you went through all this extensive surgery like do you feel do you feel retarded now like it's kind of one of those things like of course people are going to say that they felt better after getting this really expensive like time-consuming surgery no one's going to report that they that they feel like an idiot so as far as treating people goes we we have this problem where where psychology doesn't always work and, and authority figures in psychology are not always trustworthy but they will talk a lot so the place that we're at right now is we've got the cognitive camp and we've got the biology camp and the cognitive camp doesn't like the biology camp the cognitive camp are people who believe that gender is a social construct and if you are if you are born female you can become male if you want and, and you know you can just kind of you can wear you know, like a man could wear women's clothing and he could be perfectly happy and this is true actually men can wear women's clothing and be perfectly happy you can do a lot of things in fact I think that if you were really fond of, of the idea of being a woman you could very well get surgery become uh, physically uh, you could gain physically the appearance of being a woman and you could still be very happy if you're an, if you're just a happy individual normally uh, you could take the hormones and you would be happy with the hormones and all this this and so forth if that was your objective but what these people are I believe are case studies and you get into this thing where where if you have like a case study case studies are very compelling and uh, I have a friend like I say who argues with me about this sort of thing because he now considers himself transgender and I'll come back now to models and explain that when you get into the cognitive field of psychology, you might see on Tumblr these days where people talk about trans and gender queer and gender fluid and gender this, gender that, gender this. They're making models for every single type of person that, that's out there, every kind of gender interest that you could have, whether you want to sleep with men, women, whether you feel like a male or a woman, whether you want to wear women's clothes but you still feel like a man, all that. They've come up with all these different models to describe these people. And it drives me crazy because I feel like this is like if the, NA, uh, if the NAACP made up models to describe every kind of black person. I mean, think about that. Does that not sound kind of racist to, to try and make a model to describe, like, specifically black people or, or things like that? You get, like, it just drives me crazy to see people who are like, this, this is your gender model, you know? This is like your gender fluid, that's your gender model, you know? Your gender queer, that's your gender model. Your trans, that's your gender model. And when the reality may be that you, it's, there's gradients, and you can't possibly name every single gradient because everyone develops differently depending on their hormones and what's going on in their bodies. So anyway though, I've got a friend who's really into these gender models and he really, 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 he really wants to support them and really prove that these things are true. And so he's become, he's, he's become trans and he's now fitting in to the model of a transgendered male. 
uh, or rather male to female. He's fitting into this model because he reads about the, the gender studies a lot. He follows all these authorities, he reads what they say, and he kind of tries to emulate what they're saying, and he tries to fit their models. And not thinking that the models are incorrect because it's very ideological. The point is that people are supposed to fit the models, and if they don't, then society has somehow failed and we need to make people fit the models. This is one of these things, it's like, it's, it's an ideological thing, and ideologies like to make ideal worlds that people fit into. You know, if you don't fit the ideal world, then we need to change society, we need to make it work, we need to do this or do that. But my friend, though, he wants to fit into this model. And so he's pursuing this whole thing, and I, I think he's very seriously considering, considering surgery right now. And if he gets the surgery, he might be fine, he might be happy, he might get along okay. But he's mad. He's mad because other people won't accept that he's going to be a woman. They're going to recognize him as a man who became a woman. And he just wants them to say, like, uh, you're a woman now, you're no different than all the other women. And I don't know how to feel about this. Because here's the thing that's frustrating is that whatever side of the fence you sit on, whether or not you believe that gender is a social construct or whether or not you recognize that gender, gender uh, ambiguity is a real thing, you can find examples of people who represent either ideal. This is the problem with case studies, is I look at my friend and I see that he is actually purposefully trying to represent this notion that gender is a social construct, construct and he can just become whatever gender he wants. But then you also look at people who were born uh, with with ambiguous genitals and they got surgery and now they take hormones and they rather it's rather serious for them for them it's a medical thing like if they don't take the hormones then their body may not produce it normally because they weren't born uh, the, the, the organs that are supposed to produce those hormones weren't formed correctly and uh, and their lives are not as well they don't their lives don't go as well without the treatment so you've got serious medical concerns and then you've got people over here who are not in a medical state whatsoever uh, and they all exist, and, and they have their valid points from their own perspectives and their own standpoints. There are people who really have no control over it, and there are people who probably do. And so this is where it gets interesting, where you get these different sides of the debate, where you have people on one side who are kind of mad and they don't like it, and they say, like, if you're born a woman, you know you're a woman, and if you're born a man, you're a man. And, uh, and you can't just change and do whatever you want. And of course you've got these people who want to just change because they'd like to change and there's no real psychological reason. For them it's not a disease, they just want to be a different gender. And they don't like that, you know? It's like, they, it's like wanting to get tattoos or extreme body piercings. For them, they're fighting a social norm, a social perception. You know, like if they want to get a nose ring, then they don't want the nose ring to impact their hiring prospects. They just want to get the nose ring. That's what it's like for them. And then you've got people over who are actually in a medical situation where they actually have a concern. And then maybe their brains are developed a little bit differently. Maybe they uh, really do genuinely feel like the opposite gender. They, they don't feel happy in the role that they've been trying to play. And they kind of need to switch over. They need to be taking these other hormones to feel in a happier state. And these two sides, I feel like, you see on the internet that frequently they clash because the people with legitimate problems don't really like to be represented by people who just want to change their bodies for the sake of an ideology or because they're fighting social norms. It's, it's something It's like this is not a social battle for them. This is like, this is really my life and I'm trying to fix my life. So, yes, that's, that's where we're at uh, with the study of gender ambiguity today. Um, no real, I, I hope that I come to the end with no real clear decisive stance on it because there is none. This is just something that I thought that I should talk about because it's come up and, and it's, it can be destructive to people. I think that it's important to promote this notion that there are people who really uh, have a problem and it's an identified problem, it's something that biologists recognize, it's something that, uh, that may be hard to detect in some people because sometimes you could, you could potentially, I imagine, be born in a case of gender ambiguity and, uh, and not have obvious physical symptoms of it, in which case your situation is very difficult because the treatment of the problem relies completely on self-reporting. You just have to go to the psychologist and tell them, like, I don't know, I don't like to do guy. Like, I'm a lady and I don't like to do girl things, or I'm a guy and I don't like to do guy things. And, and really, they just have to take your word for it. But then, of course, you've also got these people over on the other side 
who, who skew the perception and make it seem as though you're doing it just for your own interest. And, uh, and, and yes, very interesting world, rather tough hurdle uh, in psychology today, but many hurdles are very tough in psychology today. It's important to understand that models are made, models are not accurate. We uh, have a very low accuracy of describing people with our models. I would not put most models above like 5% uh, as far as accuracy goes. So rather, rather dim view on getting too attached to models. Of course, I would probably make some people really angry because there's, a, like I say, there's a lot of people who take a very ideological stance and they don't like the notion whatsoever that, that the models could be wrong because they're ideological. They've got, people have got to fit into these models. This is how we make the ideal society. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen. I hope that, uh, that this concept of making amateur models to describe people will one day fall to the wayside. But, uh, but in any case, I hope that, that some people found this rather educational, kind of just a little bit about psychology today and the study of gender. Uh, uh, one more thing I will say, they think that potentially gender ambiguity is caused during prenatal development. It's actually, it has nothing to do with genetics. This is when people, some people bring this up when you talk about whether or not it's a medical concern. And they say like, how can you be born with this genetically? It doesn't make any sense because how would you pass on these genes? Like if you're, if you're homosexual, you don't, tend to have children, assuming that you stick to same-sex partnerships. Well, if it's prenatal development, what this is is that your body kind of goes through cycles of intense development when you're in the womb, and, and a lot of that is controlled by hormone regulations as your mother exposes you to hormones. Like if you're more female, you'll get more estrogen exposure. But during certain parts of development, they find that if you're exposed to high quantities of the opposite hormone, it can affect your development. So they think that this is probably where it comes from, is at some point during when your brain is developing, like if to become homosexual, maybe when your brain is developing, you might be exposed to some hormones of the opposite gender and it causes your brain to develop a little bit differently, more towards the female uh, preferences or this or that. And, uh, and that's where it comes from. They think that's also how you wind up with ambiguous uh, uh, like genitals, where when your genitals were developing, you got exposed to the opposite hormones and developed rather confusing, a confusing set of hormones. So the same thing may happen as people who have this as an actual legitimate medical concern, maybe people who had their brain development was uh, affected differently. And it's not a genetic thing. It's also not something that you could treat. Like these people aren't, aren't like you can't just, you couldn't just give them like, I don't know, surgery and just make it go away because their brains are just different. You know, their brains are developed differently. So uh, yeah, so that's the closing note. Is that's the current current theory on how that develops. One of the one of the current theories. There's a there's a bunch of them. It's ongoing research, but uh, fascinating stuff. Hopefully uh, headed towards a brighter future. I personally don't have a lot of faith in the cognitive perspective, but uh, but biology and and medicine is improving. We may one day be able to just shine a light into people's head and figure out whether or not uh, are you are you ambiguously gendered or do you just want to get the body alterations. We will know then. But until that time, it's a sensitive subject, and uh, and I feel like people should just be aware of of some of the facts of just how it kind of works, because it does affect people in my life. I know people who are into this sort of thing, and I know that they they could potentially be doing harm to people who who really who really uh, have problems. So I don't know. Just be aware. Sensitive subject, uh, contentious subject, strange subject, something we know virtually nothing about. But uh, yes, that was, the, that was a scientific episode today, and I think that's all I've got for now, so I will catch you guys later.